morning. Uh, firstly, can I say a quick thank you uh, to Manu and the team for the uh, lovely invitation. I had a great time, really nice meeting. Second thing, they confiscated my Mac, and so the only visual imagery you'll see is me waving my hands around. So, right, um, let's start. Um, basically, what Sepsis 3 brought, that's uh, the topic that I was asked to address. So, um, I think it's fair to say, and I talked about this yesterday, I'm just going to touch on it briefly now, that it was a no-brainer that we had to change because the previous definitions had come out in 2003 and things had moved on. The epidemiology was a complete mess as we didn't have precise clinical criteria. We'd moved on in our understanding of the pathophysiology. It wasn't just ooh, systemic inflammation. There were major issues with using SIRS, and there was a lot of overlap redundancy. When did, for example, infection begin, or sepsis end and infection begin? There was too much blurring around the edges. We needed clarity. And the goals were very much to try and update the definitions to reflect our current understanding, to provide specific criteria which hadn't been previously given of what we meant by sepsis, septic shock, in a clinical sense, to offer much greater consistency to help epidemiology, coding, research, etc. Perhaps as an offshoot to come up with metrics to help identify those patients who are likely to have sepsis and do badly at the bedside. And finally, and I think a really, really, really crucial point, is to make people think, discuss, argue, debate, do further research so we can move on to sepsis 4 in X year's time. So it isn't and was never intended to be the final word, and it's not meant to be a bedside management tool. I'll touch on that later on. So we have a new definition. The essence of what something is is what the di dictionary describes as a definition. And we characterized, well, we gave the definition as a life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregula dysregulated host response to infection. So in other words, it takes away these patients from a bog standard infection, and it makes them bad infection, the, the infection that ends up killing you. And it's the host response that kills you, not the bug per se. It's how the host responds. So this is bad infection leading to organ dysfunction, leading to a threat to life. And we characterized it clinically using the SOFA score, a change of two or more above the patient's baseline. I won't go through the SOFA score. It's been around a long time. It's not perfect, but it's long been with us. It's well established, and there's a clear relationship, as I'll show you later, between the SOFA score and mortality. It uses variables that we will routinely measure, in our day-to-day -day practice and in many low-middle-income countries, not every country by any means, but many of them will also measure these standard variables. And we went to big data to come up with these criteria. 850,000 patients with suspected infection in a hospital setting. And if you had this SOFA score of two or more, this rise, that gave you a greater than 10% chance of dying. So it is life-threatening. However, and I don't do it, and I don't expect anyone else to have to measure it at the bedside, just like we don't measure any other score at the bedside barring Glasgow Coma Scale, which takes one minute. Everything else, you treat the patient in front of you. If they're hypoxemic, hypotensive, oliguric, that's what you treat. You don't bother to do a score and then go, oh, the score's so-and-so, I now need to treat them. We treat the patient. So the score is more useful to characterize what we're doing, operationalize, be able to transmit information, look at trajectory, whatever. The Australians, Australasians, sorry, New Zealand was involved as well, um, recently published this, looking at the prognostic accuracy. And you can see there's this very nice relationship with increasing SOFA score and the risk of dying. So these are septic patients, infection, brought them into the ICU. That increasing SOFA score relates very nicely to a, the risk of dying. 
What about septic shock? What do we mean by shock? There are nice physiological descriptions, but we wanted it to represent a patient who has a higher risk of dying than sepsis alone. So it's this combination of cardiovascular and metabolic cellular abnormalities that together give the patient an increased risk of dying. So how did we characterize it? Again, we went to big data to inform our decision. And basically, it came down to a combination of, after adequate volume resuscitation, this is the perfect meeting for everyone to argue what does adequate mean, because there is no real consensus in the literature. But after adequate volume resuscitation, the patient remains hyperlactatemic, and they remain hypotensive with a mean below 65. So the lactate is above 2. Looking at the multinational surviving sepsis campaign registry, you see that combination, organ dysfunction with hypotension and a persisting lactate after fluid, gave an over 40% chance of dying. Remember that number. I'll come back to that later on. If you had organ dysfunction, but only one of the components, a high lactate, a low blood pressure, or none of the components, but you still had organ dysfunction, the mortality was a lot lower and very similar. So it's the combination, the sum of the parts, that actually magnify that risk of dying, which fulfills the definition that we came up with. And how's it working? Well, studies are coming out. People are looking retrospectively at their databases and prospectively which is great. This is exactly what we wanted. So this came from Germany, 12,000 odd patients. And clearly, when you give a more rigorous criteria for defining septic shock, the numbers go down. And that's what they found. And these are sicker patients, the mortality increases. So they found an ICU mortality of 44%, just like I showed you earlier, and a hospital mortality of 51%. Argentina, this is a prospective study. So Elisa Estensoro, who led the study in Argentina, has very kindly allowed me to show these data. Again, it's been submitted for publication. So 49 ICUs, 800-odd patients. The mortality, again, sepsis, 27%. Septic shock, 51%. Very similar. In the UK, so Manu Shankahari, who led on the... Uh, Septic shock work for sepsis 3. ICU mortality in 200,000 patients for sepsis, 22%. For septic shock, 47%. And this is a hospital in Brazil, 7% if you didn't have the uh, two SOFA score or above criteria, 25% if you did, 46% if you had septic shock. And I've heard it's not yet published, but similar data from Japan and Korea. So we're talking the same language, and there's this remarkable consistency, whereas before there wasn't. If you look at septic shock, there was a fourfold variation in mortality, a tenfold variation in incidence, because people were using different ways of describing it. One standard way, we have international consistency. And again, other prospective studies are coming through. This came from France, Spain, Belgium, Switzerland, 30 emergency departments, over 1,000 consecutive patients. Not surprisingly, SIRS picked up many of these patients. They had the temperature, the white count that made people think, oh, could they have infection? So obviously, quick SOFA, I'll touch on later, SOFA, there were fewer of these patients, but the ability to prognosticate was greater with quick sofa and sofa than it was for severe sepsis and SIRS. And they said, yep, in terms of prognostication, it's better. But again, we're still going to treat patients regardless of their prognosis, unless it's so dire we think comfort measures may be more appropriate. This was uh, an analysis of an American database, and they picked out patients with first infection events, Two and a half thousand. Again, many had SIRS criteria, fewer had SOFA, even fewer had two or more of the quick SOFA criteria. So, not surprisingly, the sicker ones were being picked out. There were fewer of them, they had a higher mortality. And the authors 
basically concluded that, yes, this may be useful for epidemiology and for research stratification. You're homing in on the more at-risk patient. This came out from Australia. It was a sort of, I suppose, prospective look at a retros oh, sorry, it was a retrospective look at a, uh, a database collected prospectively in patients in the emergency department with infection. And they looked at sepsis 2 and compared it against sepsis 3. And you'll see that sepsis 3 picked out an additional 630 patients with organ dysfunction and an extra 56 deaths. And of these 632 patients, the one-year mortality in these patients was 28%. Again, it does suggest that there's an improvement over what we had before, or at least what they called sepsis 2. Other studies from Greece, again, the sensitivity in predicting 28 mortality was very good. And outside the ICU, they looked at patients who were admitted into ICU. And again, the misclassification was significantly lower with the new criteria. This came out recently, very interesting paper. There's a lot of hype in the literature about, oh, sepsis is going up, the incidence is going up, but aren't we doing well? The mortality is going down. In America, there's an incentivization to call code a patient as having sepsis. You get more money than if they just merely have a pneumonia. So there's a reimbursement initiative or incentive. And Michael Kompas and colleagues looked at this in a huge sort of population database and compared it with clinical data using the sepsis-3 criteria. And they looked at 409 hospitals and found 6% qualified of all hospitalizations qualified as having sepsis. However, the incidence and the mortality were static. So showing their graphs, I'll uh, simplify it a little bit, but essentially the red line and arrow shows what's been reported in claims data. A huge increase over about five, six years, from 8% to 12%, a 50% increase. Oh my goodness, it's an epidemic. But at the same time, the blue line shows looking at the clinical coding using the sepsis-3 criteria, no change. Likewise, mortality or being discharged to a hospice, because of that huge rise in denominator, the percentage of patients dying has dropped. However, that just reflects a big increase in denominator. If you look at the absolute number of people dying, the blue line, no change. So again, it's how we look at data, how we interpret data is crucial. Specific groups, so this came out recently uh, from a group in Italy looking at cirrhosis. They make the point that SIRS isn't particularly useful, and they found that Quicksofa and SOFA were more useful, and especially in identifying those cirrhotic patients with bacterial infections who would go on to do badly. Quick few words on Quicksofa. So Quicksofa was intended to be a rapid bedside assessment using three simple things, respiratory rate, augmentation, so any abnormality, any change in Glasgow Coma Score, or a drop in systolic, systolic blood pressure below 100. And these things are actually well known in the literature, that these are good identifiers of patients who go on to do badly. And Chris Seymour, who did the work, showed with lots of very clever you know, regression analyses, that these were the three best variables of things that are routinely recorded in an emergency department or a ward that identified those patients who are more likely to do badly. However, and again, it's been misinterpreted, it was never intended to be a screening tool. Just because you have the two or more, yes, those people who do, they are at higher risk, but it doesn't mean you should ignore those with zero or one criteria. So again, there's been confusion despite, as I'll show you in a second, what the paper said. But this basically highlights those patients who have two or more, and you can assess this in one minute at the bedside, are those more likely to have organ dysfunction, more likely to need an ICU bed, more likely to end up dying.
and this is what we said in the paper, they're not intended to be a standalone definition, and you shouldn't not bother treating the patient, not bother investigating them, just because they haven't hit the magic number two. Man who had four, here the magic number's two. So, again, we're looking at clinical common sense, not rigid application of, oh, it's two, below two, I don't need to bother. Uh, no, please don't go away with that message. And predictably, Quicksofa isn't a screening tool, and there are lots of studies coming through to say, oh, Quicksofa's not a screening tool. We said so anyway, but it makes the point. It reinforces the message. There have been criticisms. Good, we wanted that because it's healthy to have that because it encourages debate. Oh, you shouldn't use Quicksofa until it's been validated. We said exactly the same. This was done on a retrospective analysis of predominantly US hospital databases. How does this relate prospectively to Europe, Africa, Asia, wherever? So it did need to be looked at prospectively. However, because it's quick, it can be done at the bedside, there is utility there. Oh, I love my lactate. You, you didn't measure lactate. You didn't mention lactate. Again, what we said in the paper is if you like lactate and you feel it's useful for your clinical management, carry on using it. However, the analysis show it didn't add much in terms of predictive validity over the two quick sofa criteria. And it's not a marker of organ dysfunction per se, a high lactate, it's a marker of stress. So if the patient responds well to your treatment, the patient's stress levels go down and the lactate improves. Oh, other scores are better, absolutely. And there are lots and lots of scores out there. So again, we said in the paper, you need the comparator studies. The more data collected, the more accurate the score. However, collecting more data requires more work, adds complexity, etc. Whereas this, you can do very quickly at the bedside without any blood tests. And luckily in the UK, big plug for the UK, we have a national early warning system which is now actually being rolled out around the whole country, nursing homes, GPs, emergency departments, the whole country will be using it. And they use seven criteria, and three of them are actually the quick sofa criteria. So clearly, news will be better because you're recording seven things rather than three. And in the UK, the news score of five or more triggers a call to a doctor. We're worried about this patient. However, it's emphasized in this scoring system too. Just because the patient doesn't get to five but you're worried doesn't mean you shouldn't not do something. You have to interact, intervene, look at the patient. A few quick minutes, two minutes to go. Pediatrics, again, we said in the paper there's a need to look at pediatrics. This has recently come out in JAMA. So they came out with age-related blood pressures and so forth and basically showed you could characterize children very well in terms of here prognostic risk. You're more likely to die if you had sepsis looking, change in SOFA score or septic shock. The mortality goes up. What about low middle income countries that can't measure lactate? That's true. Again, we acknowledge this in the paper. You can't do everything if things aren't available and you need to come up with surrogates. And so we encourage looking at surrogate markers to see if they were as applicable. This nice study from, uh, well, it's a questionnaire from Africa, from Martin Dunster and colleagues, showed that this is a number of years ago, but very few respondents from these African countries were actually able to do the surviving sepsis guidelines. Less than 2% could do all of them. And in terms of measuring lactate or even giving antibiotics, they couldn't achieve it. I'm actually quite grateful that ICD-11, which is coming out, I think, next year, will be the new international coding system, and they hope it will last for 20 years, actually is incorporating sepsis-3. And um, this is apparently the first time a coding change has ever been based on validated data. So they're actually quite chuffed, and they hope it will happen for other conditions. I asked uh, the committee, what about hospitals that can't measure lactate for septic shock? And they laughed at me, and I said, well, what's funny? And they said, well, what happens if you have chest pain in the jungle and we can't measure troponin or do an ECG? It's exactly the same issue. You can't cover the whole world. It's not realistic. 
quick sofa. This study from Gabon suggested that, yes, you can detect patients who are likely to do badly. They had bacterial infections, malaria, whatever. And finally, I'll mention this. This came from uh, Jim Russell recently. Um, he did a retrospective analysis based on the VAS trial, which looked at vasopressin versus norepinephrine for septic shock. In other words, they were hypotensive and needed a presser. And then he reanalyzed the data, subdividing the patients into those with a high lactate, the new sepsis 3 septic shock, or those without. And he also measured cytokines, 39 of them. And he found, as I mentioned before, you were looking for a sicker subset, so it would have reduced enrollment by half. And the cytokine levels in these, the new septic shock criteria, were much, much higher. And interestingly, he showed that if you didn't have new septic shock, vasopressin was beneficial. If you did have septic shock with the new criteria, there was no difference. So again, you're seeing an interesting treatment effect. Peter Rademacher, who was involved with the HYPER-2S study, giving hyperoxia to patients with septic shock, they've seen a similar effect. It's been submitted for publication with hyperoxia causing harm only in those patients fulfilling the sepsis-3 criteria. Gilali Anand looked at the um, steroid data, and interestingly, the fluid data, and he finds that colloid, any colloid, actually is beneficial in those fulfilling the sepsis-3 shock criteria. So it's already making us challenge previous trials and perhaps coming up with new hypotheses. The rolling ball, it's out there. This is a couple of weeks ago. Manu mentioned Altmetric scores, 2,600, 2 million views. And that's of the paper. Don't know how many people have read the paper, but there are 2 million views. And uh, last year, it was the 19th most discussed scientific paper, both in the published and the sort of social media world, out of uh, 2.7 million outputs. So it's out there, people are talking about it. Hopefully, it's updated our understanding. We're giving more objective criteria, so hopefully we're becoming more consistent. The early data are encouraging, great. We're seeing much more generalizability, and possibly this may actually help research as well. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much indeed for listening.